Oh, we got one more person joining right now. Great. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Gabriel Miguel. I'm the founder and executive director of the Anastasia Foundation. We are empowering, connecting, and inspiring Ringing Cedars readers in the English language around the world, trying to connect as many people as we can, turn this earth into the beautiful, flourishing paradise full of kin's domains and happy families that we all want it to be. And so, oh, we got one more person joining. And yeah, so this is the North America Ringing Cedars community call. And the goal of this call is just to have a informal, relaxed space for, you know, readers of the Ringing Cedars in North America and sometimes Europe to come in and uh, connect and share stories, ask questions, and sometimes even meet some people that are close to you. So that's always a nice thing. And yeah, this is just, like I said, very relaxed, informal. We'll be here for about an hour and a half to two hours. And um, I'm sure everybody here will be respectful and kind uh, of, you know, to one another and allow everybody to speak. But once we, we get the discussion going, feel free to just jump in and, uh, you know, um, don't don't worry too much about that. Everybody is free to participate as much as you'd like. And if you have any questions, any topics, any things that, that you'd like to discuss with the group, right, um, feel free to think about that, note some of that down. And you're in the presence of um, a bunch of Ringing Cedars readers here. So you're you're in a unique conversational space. Uh, and I like to start these by having people share your location. If you want to share your location in the chat, that's always really nice to see where people are tuning in from. Uh, I am in Asheville, North Carolina. That's not going to change. I know a couple of you here. We've got Lenny and Evelyn in New York City. That's beautiful. I love that. We got Brad in Costa Rica. Very cool. Is it, Brad, is it 6, 12 in Costa Rica? Are you guys same time zone as us? East Coast time? Um, Sunshine Coast, Vancouver. Beautiful. Okay, 4 p.m. Different time zone. I didn't know that. Oklahoma, USA. Love that. All right. Yeah. Nice. So uh, we've definitely got some familiar faces here. We got a little bit of a different group from last time. Okay, more Livingston, Montana. Very cool. Originally from Wrigley Field, UK. All right. 11 p.m. I, I respect the dedication, Sandy. Thanks for being here. If you find it valuable enough to be with us at 11 p.m. in the UK, I love it. Um, Knoxville, Tennessee, Golden Bay, New Zealand. What time is it in New Zealand, Lena? Um, we have Washington. Got you. Wow, I wonder what time it is in New Zealand. Uh, 10 a.m. That's not so bad. Okay, um, not so bad. Very cool. Thanks for being here. Thanks for starting off your day with us. So... Nice to see you all. Thank you all for being here. I like to start these with a little bit of an introduction and uh, feel free to share um, about, you know, who you are or um, how you found the books or what's motivating you to be on the call. Just a, a little thing to introduce yourself and kind of I just want to get the conversation flowing uh, from there. And yeah, we'll be here for about until eight o'clock. Um, p.m. Eastern time. So if anybody wants to introduce themselves, feel free. Nobody here is going to bite. Um, and I'll, I'll probably say a little bit about myself, maybe just to get things going. So uh, my name is Gabriel for whoever doesn't know me here. I can't I can't make assumptions. And uh, I found the Ringing Cedars books in 2014. So I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary, actually, in November, um, which is a really interesting milestone for me. Um, very, very interesting milestone that I'm excited to be approaching 30th birthday and 10 years of reading uh, The Ringing Cedars. And um, well, I can't I can't even describe how life changing it's been for me. And I'm here with all you guys now because of that. And uh, I don't know, I got to say, I'm, now that I think about it, I feel like I'm a very, very blessed man. Just get to be with some of the best best of humanity. You know, I think uh, The Ringing Cedars people are just some of the best people that uh that are around so anyway if anybody else wants to get going um feel free uh i don't want to you know call anybody out 
I don't like feeling like I'm back in school or something. But um, anybody who would like to introduce themselves, feel free to jump in. I'm probably the new guy on the block. Um, David Lewis from Livingston, Montana. Grew up there in, in Chicago area. Um, I read the Ringing Cedars books in 2006. A friend of mine from Canada told me about the, uh, gave me the fifth one. My wife and I read mm. all of them right away, and we decided to um, implement what Anastasia has in them. So we founded Paradise Permaculture Institute, and it's a nonprofit in Montana. We've got 5.78 acres. We're developing a uh, permaculture demonstration site a la um, kind of a meditation area. I have a, not, a separate nonprofit called the Heart Center. And recently, just one quick story, uh, Bob Quinn, who wrote a book on uh, how he, he basically single-handedly developed Kamut in Montana, and all Kamut has to be organic. Mm -hmm. So he lives up in Big mm -hmm. Sandy, which is near Great Falls, and he visited our property and was really impressed with what we're doing. We've got a rolling high tunnel greenhouse, 30 by 48. We've got a one acre food forest. Uh, we've got a washing station for our produce. We've got eight raised beds. We've planted over 500 trees and berry bushes and nut trees. And um, he was impressed, especially with our food forest, one acre food forest. And um, so we're gonna visit him uh, Monday and Tuesday in Great and Big Sandy. And that's the area where they grow a lot of organic lentils. Um, and you may have heard about the underground lentil, uh, lentil underground book or whatever I think it's called. So Bob Quinn, uh, he, he started the organic movement pretty much in Montana, or at least got it really going. And it's really cool that all Kamut, which is the ancient grain of wheat, has to be organic to be called Kamut. So I thought that's mm. pretty nice. So I've taught a lot um, through my nonprofit, the Heart Center, and we've done six, what we call Anastasia in the Garden, actually seven, where we have a one day class. One, one year it was a five day class. We were all out on our property. We're doing projects, we're building guilds. And if you're not familiar with a guild, probably all of you are, but it's just like we have like a cherry tree or a plum tree. And around that, we plant all these other plants that are collaborative with that, that tree. And so every, every year when we do one of these Anastasia in the Garden events, we, we try to build a guild. And the original guild is so beautiful. It's amazing. And um, last year was a bumper crop year for apples and cherries in our area and a lot of fruit trees. Unfortunately, we still see chemtrails, you know, and so we, a friend of mine developed um, and produces organites. I don't know if you've heard of organites, but it uses the orgone energy, Wilhelm Reich coined that term. And and actually we have a chem, chem buster, chemtrail buster, chem buster organite right in the center of our property. And when the planes go overhead, it's interesting because my spiritual thing is to transmute the all the toxic chemicals that they're releasing into life-giving crystalline flakes of of divine energy and because usually i used to just kind of not curse them but i used to just ask the angels to to wipe out everything yeah there i see ruth um but what i noticed is the chemtrails stop right before they go over our property. They just stop. So that's the chem, the chem buster is really working. And uh, so anyway, I'll, that's a lot of, about me and I'll, I'll be beautiful. quiet, but our, our acreage is beautiful. I wanted to be, I wanted to call it Anastasia's acres, but my wife wouldn't let me. So, <laughs> um, and we we're just outside all the time gardening and my wife's outside right now. And, you know, to change your life, to just be outside gardening, farming with the plants, talking to the elementals, the nature spirits, communing with them is, is a wonderful thing. One, one final little thing, and then I'll be quiet. 
a lady came on our property during one of these Anastasia in the Garden events, and she had lived at, at Findhorn in Scotland. And she was very sensitive. And she found two places on our property that there were fairy wells. They're called fairy wells, where the, the energy goes into the earth and can come out of the earth. And it's, it's a very sacred thing. And so there are circles. And so we put shells and little crystals and elementals around in each of the fairy wells. And they're, so I can't, I can't mow over them. <laughs> I have to, uh, they're really awesome. So it's nice to commune with people that are, that love the divine mother, let's say as mother earth, that love the elementals, the nature spirits, the fairies. And, um, I, you know, it's just wonderful to be with you all. So I'll be quiet. Thank you, Gabriel. Yeah, David, it's a pleasure. Wow, what an introduction. Um, I'm surprised that we haven't met or connected before, but that's the whole point of these of these calls. So it's really nice to uh, get to meet you, brother. And I'd love to learn more about what you're doing out there. If you ever want to do more events um, in Montana, be happy to help, you know, spread the word about your events and, and uh, to our community and try to bring more people in. And if oh, I wanted to offer as well, um, the gentleman who developed the Kamut, um, if you want, I can send a free book, uh, free book one to you. If you want to give one to him, um, when you, when you get to meet him, um, but I'd be more than happy to send you a copy of book one. Sure. Yeah. Bob Quinn is his name. He's, I think he's in his late seventies, maybe even early eighties, mm -hmm. but he's a, he's a, um, trailblazer for organics and for Kamut. I'd be happy to do that. And by the way, that's amazing. Having a big event at Mount Shasta. Next year in the summer, I was thinking about inviting you to come and speak. If I paid all your expenses to get there and your motel, would that be good enough? It's I think summer, so. Summer yeah. solstice next year. Okay, that sounds that sounds like good timing for me to be uh, in California anyway. So that that sounds good to me. Let's talk okay, about. I'll it. have to get it approved Perfect. by our board, but um, I'd like to do yeah. that if. Yeah, that's very generous, and I'd be more than happy to uh to come. Any 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 opportunities to uh spread the message of Anastasia, I'm I'm more than happy to do. Um, beautiful, welcome, brother. Glad to have you. All right, that that was a heck of an introduction, guys. Let's let's keep it rolling. Uh, who wants to who wants to come up next? Say hi to the group. I guess I could introduce myself too because I might be cut off. Um, it's an interesting day here in mm -hmm. New Zealand. We've got a power cut and I just run to the spot where my phone gets a reception to at least reconnect the game and not just drop out. And I found out mm -hmm. the power cut's going to be for the next six hours or something. And my phone is only on a low charge. So so excited to be here <laughs> and um welcome as you can yes and i would love you to come to new zealand gabriel <laughs> i'm not sure if I've i will been be in new zealand. able to pay pay all the expenses but um yeah that would be awesome because it's it's still it's not i mean the, i met a lot of people who read the books but for some reason you know like yeah, there's only one. There's only one friend who is just so on fire. She even had her wedding mm -hmm. in the um, Anastasia style. You know, um, that was just absolutely beautiful. So the little seeds, the little plants here mm -hmm. that are growing. Yeah. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah, and if you, um, I'm very passionate about people growing the movement and and connecting readers in every country. Um, so if you ever want to do anything, try to bring readers together in New Zealand, let me know. I'd be happy to to help in any way that I can. Um, that goes to mm -hmm. anyone in any country who's here right now. So um, awesome. yes, welcome, Lena. Thank so you. glad that you're with us. It looks like a beautiful day. Are you on the beach over there? Is there a water behind um, you? It looks gorgeous. Yes. So I don't know how to Look turn the that. camera around. And it's my yes. Wow. <laughs> it's a it's a is that, gorgeous. Is that day. the is that the ocean? Yes. 
So it's Golden wow. Bay, and we actually in the winter time, but today we're just blessed. And um, yeah, we we have sunny days like this through the winter, and still growing stuff in the garden. So it's yeah, it's a beautiful climate. I'm originally from Russia. That's incredible. Actually. Yeah, so it's it's um it's it's very different to be in a country where there's no no real winters. Mm. Mm -hmm. excellent well thank you for sharing that beautiful new zealand view with us because that's that's just beautiful and inspiring i love that thanks for being here i got it i'm almost thinking of renaming these calls to just like international ringing cedar calls because i don't want anyone to feel excluded if they're not from north america like i really uh just i want everybody to join i love seeing this all righty um, we've got Elizabeth in the waiting room. All right. Who wants to uh, introduce themselves next? This is awesome. Welcome, welcome. Oh, look at Lenny. Lenny and Evelyn, you guys look great. I guess we could go next. Yeah, you guys look great over there in the garden. So it was 2008. And we were volunteering at a like a, a boot camp program. And we were as volunteers, we each were assigned a group of like 20 people. And I noticed these two women in the group that I was in charge of. Um, they were older and they had like a they had a cedar pendant. And I kind of called them troublemakers mm -hmm. because they weren't like playing along with the program. They were kind of doing their own thing and they're always to the side, you know. So they were troublemakers. But I noticed on one of the rides back to the resort, one of them, she kept staring at me, like very, very intently. Like I thought, you know, is she mad at me? Does she want to fight me? What's going on? And she eventually approached me and we started talking about spirituality and, and stuff like that. And And she asked me, do you know what you're supposed to do with your life? And I was like, well, you know, I've kind of, you know, all my life people have given me their thoughts on what I'm supposed to do with my life. But, you know, secretly, all I've ever wanted was to get some land and live off it like a free person. And she was like, you need to get the books called The Ringing Cedars because you're meant to do what's in these books. And normally... I don't like to read. I don't get books that people tell me, but for whatever reason, you know, I, cause I spent the week talking to her. And so I was very impressed by her. And so as soon as we got home, I bought the set, uh, read them all in like three, four months, did my second reading two years ago. Lenny? Um, are you lenny my friend you're breaking up a bit can you hear me i, I got the sun all in my eyes L lenny you're you're going robot voice on us i can't hear you much are you able to hear me perfect yeah Okay. Oh, not so perfect. <laughs> so do I do I need to start all over? No, you were you were good there. You got to the point where um you did your second reading of the books two years ago and then it started cutting off a bit. Okay. Well that was pretty much all I had to say. You know, it's been since two thousand eight. Uh, Lenny, I love you, brother. The 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 mic is kind of still cutting out, my friend. All right, Lenny. <laughs> Lenny, sorry, brother. We can't hear you.
<laughs> Lenny, I, <laughs> Lenny, I gotta mute you, man. It sounds it sounds like you're running uphill or something. Sorry, buddy. All right. I can't mute him. We want to get all the hands. All righty. I can't do it. I can't mute him. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Some technical difficulties. All righty. <laughs> All right. Great story until the until the uh until the technical difficulties kicked in. That's pretty incredible. Um. All right, friends. Anybody else want to introduce themselves? That was a that was a beautiful story by Lenny there woman just Hi comes there. right up to him and tells him to read the books can can you all Hi, hear welcome. me we hear you perfect awesome nice to meet you all um my name's Indriani. i'm living off grid on the in the coast salish sea i don't know if you are familiar with that coast salish seas uh pnw um, area and i live in a food forest it's not my land uh just a co-residing mm -hmm. here and there's like lots of edible plants and fruits and berries and so it's really beautiful here i i'm here in the group because i have just so many questions like i have lots of questions and i, I don't know if mm -hmm. now's the time to pose those questions for them to kind of just percolate for conversation is that okay mm -hmm. yeah i just i'm mostly yeah sure i'm very curious um well, I guess I could say just a little bit more about myself before I, I dive into the question. <laughs> um, I am the organizer yeah, and founder of uh, the Wisdom Way community of Sailor Seattle. Um, we practice a large range of mindfulness-based practices, including city meditation, qigong, mindful eating, um, foraging, working with the land and the elements, uh, and rooted in Taoist practice, Buddhist practice, yogic practice, and the ancient traditions. And I integrate the teachings from the Reading Cedar series where it makes sense. Um, but yeah, so yeah, among the many questions that I have, I'm just really curious to hear about homesteading projects that people have going on in what's called the United States, but particularly the Pacific Northwest. I'm wondering if there are, are any contingents in the area and the region and in Washington and um, how those projects are going in terms of integrating um, the Siberian pine tree. Um, mm. If people have successfully done that in the area. I'm really curious also about child rearing and if anybody in the group has has been doing that, like trusting um, that the youth have more knowledge than we typically assume and how that engagement works like trusting that they can discover their own knowledge on their own terms um and so yeah just really curious to see see how integrating that kind of pedagogical spiritual method of living with with youth as well as the land that you're on how that's going it, it's just like there's so much rich things to discuss and i you know it's like it's all really kind of theoretical until you like met people who are actually doing it and uh i haven't yet i haven't actually i don't know what's going on i don't know what if any of you are in eco villages if you're using the methods and how successful they've been so yeah thank mm. you so much <laughs> that's awesome thank you for joining and um great questions i made a note and we can make sure to to share those again with the group and get to those but um, I think we've got some positive answers for for your questions. Um, yeah, so great. Uh, I know Brad said he would be happy to introduce yeah. himself. So Brad, welcome. Nice to see hey. you. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Hey, um, I am Brad. So I, I'm originally from Canada, Western Canada, Alberta. I grew up on a farm and um, then kind of traveled a bit around the world. And now here I am in Costa Rica, beautiful, lush Costa Rica, where everything grows all the time, all year round. <laughs> so 
So we ended up down here, my family, my wife is originally from Costa Rica. So we decided to kind of like um, pack up from the Canadian winters and decide to try Costa Rica for a change with our two little kids. So we made it down here almost three years ago and we stayed on a small property that was like a, a cabin on a farmland area from her, uh, my wife's, um, my father-in-law, I guess. And uh, he planted about 20 years ago, a ton of fruit trees. So we, I basically could almost live off from one type of fruit to the next, like from all different types of mangoes to the cashew fruits to you name it, every type of lime and lemon and in between oranges and, and exotic fruits. And now we recently moved to a new location um, in Costa Rica, more Pacific, Central, South, and we're taking care of someone's property who did the same thing, planted all kinds of lush food forests here. So I'm discovering, I'm exploring the land and I'm discovering new types of fruit. Um, the lemon drop mangosteen is my new favorite fruit in the world right now. It is absolutely delicious. Um, so I discovered Anastasia, I'm trying to remember how, I think it was just one of those things you come across on the internet. So we did a research and I ordered the books when I was in Canada and I can't remember when, I think it was probably about eight, nine, 10 years ago. And I read it the first time. And it was like one of those things you can't put down the book from night to day, you're just reading through. It's just fascinating. I'm sure everyone is here for that reason. And so we are ideally here, we came to Costa Rica in the intention to kind of um, find like-minded people to find a plot of land, a big, big enough plot of land for people to hopefully um, come and, and find their piece of land and, and make um, a community where we can grow food and live together with our families. We have two little ones, like I said, and I think like, um, what Indrania said, uh, I hope I said your name right, but about children's intuition, we definitely are trying that. We're definitely living, our kids are twins, they're five years old, and we're going to try the unschooling, um, world schooling um, method. And it's working so far. They, they are definitely like very intriguing just to see how they develop and learn like we can learn a lot from an un, un um programmed mind of a child like they definitely have uh the wisdom of from within they have something there if we don't kind of like tell them and what to do <laughs> with their life so to speak but uh very curious curious children so we're learning lots um yeah i'm so grateful to be here uh really nice to meet everybody here and um, thank you, Gabriel, for these meetings. Oh yeah, my pleasure, brother. And uh, that's everything you share there is amazing. And um, while you're talking, you motivated me to just create a Costa Rica telegram group because I know there's so many people in Costa Rica and they we gotta start connecting people there. So literally just creating that while you're talking and uh, we'll, can add you to that and we can start trying to bring together people in costa rica um so that's great i love it um and i know a few more people want to introduce themselves here and we've got oksana um and then elizabeth so if either of you want to go feel free oh you guys here hello oksana Elizabeth. Can yeah. I, Welcome. Can you hear me? It's, a, it's Elizabeth from Australia. Um, All right. I'll just, <laughs> so I've, um, I found the Anastasia books in the early 2000s. I think it was around 2005 or so. Um, I've read them almost three times since then. Um, uh, they, you, as, as Brad said, you, I couldn't put them down. And every time I've read them, I've just picked up different things as well. So it's, it's been beautiful. Um, I've rented a lot of houses. I've moved a lot of times. I've started a lot of gardens and I've, I've never spent more than the last house we were in was seven years. 
So I got to see the garden grow for that long. Um, and, yeah, I, I become very attached to the garden, so it's really hard to leave every time. But, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to a place of our own to stay, like a, a decent-sized amount of land. So the last place was a quarter of an acre in town. Um, we've been using the Back to Eden garden method as well. Um, um, I find nice. that really beautiful. Yeah. Um, also, we homeschool. We're, we've, we're in our fourth year of homeschooling. Um, it, it was more of a learning curve for myself <laughs> to let go of um, the old school ways and trusting to let the child lead with his interests. So um, it's it's a learning experience, and it's it's becoming more enjoyable as as we um, let all those old things go. So. Um, Maybe that's about all for now for me. So I'm in Victoria in in Horsham as well at the moment. Beautiful, Elizabeth. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I gotta I gotta definitely rename these calls to like international ringing seers <laughs> calls because I love seeing everybody join. Honestly, I don't want any other Australians to feel excluded. Uh, I hope they don't. But yeah, this is this is awesome. Thank you for being here. Um, Pleasure. All right. Does anybody anybody else want to go? I know Oksana, you you mentioned, um, but if nobody else wants to introduce themselves, that's totally fine. We can just start to uh, have a bit of a conversation here. Um, welcome, Denise. Thanks for joining. I saw you join a little while ago, and um, okay, Oksana, if you're good, then we can just get into it. So. Indrayani brought up some interesting questions earlier. Um, it sounds like a couple of people are already answering her questions here about um, the, right, the homeschooling and raising your children in a bit more of a ringing cedars aligned way. I know there's definitely a good number of people doing it. And um, yeah, so if anybody, if anybody wants to share about that, and I know that people do have success growing the Siberian pine in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I know specifically, at least uh, in British Columbia, people are growing them and it's working. Um, so that's good. And honestly, I don't even know if we've got like a Washington group, but if you come on Telegram, Indriani, you could definitely find more people in the Pacific Northwest in general, um, which is which is very cool. And then Elizabeth, speaking of the of the back to Eden method, I sent Paul Gauchi uh book one several years ago i mean i i like binged all his videos i i love paul um so much and i got to speak to him on the phone a few times and um he liked he liked the books and his wife as well she's like a midwife and i don't know how many hundreds or thousands of births she's been a part of but pretty uh prolific with her midwifery work and um i actually emailed her not too long ago i want to connect with her she was pretty interested in the ideas as well so um yeah sending sending paul lots of love if you guys haven't seen the back to eden documentary uh of the growing methods of paul gauchi i'd highly recommend that because it's pretty incredible i love the way he connects everything to god god told me this god told me that and he's learning through intuition mm. Right. Yeah. He has a beautiful, beautiful Christian faith and he's always praying and he's trying to use like these God inspired methods in the garden, you know, um, very, very beautiful, um, man with very strong faith. And he's always like asking God, like, what do I do here? What do I do there? You know, in the garden. And I, I just find that to be such a beautiful approach, right? He's literally just trying to have his conversation with God all the time in the garden. It's a beautiful thing. Um, David, oh, you guys visited Paul. That's amazing. I wish I, I could have got to see. I know he's not doing garden tours anymore. Yeah, his apple trees were low to the ground because he can't climb because of his disability from Vietnam. Uh, Agent Orange, he uses a rake. He walks with a rake and he uses that rake with the wood chips. But he the trees were laden with the biggest apples I've ever seen. And you bite into them and they're just totally, you know, like watery. It's amazing. 
And he is such a sweet, humble man. We were just really impressed with him. Yeah, you know, when I watched the documentary, what you're talking about, the how watery the fruits were, a lot of his videos, he'll cut open like a piece of kale and just hold it upside down and it'll start dripping water. Like I've never seen that. Or uh, the the apples just, you know, bursting with water because um, he grows in wood chips in the tree and, it re you know, it retains for anybody who isn't aware of, of how he grows. He uh, uses wood chips And it, the trees get a lot of water from the wood chips and um, pretty incredible. Yeah, you guys should definitely check that out. That's amazing. You got to meet him. I wish I could have met him. Beautiful. All right. Does anybody have any questions or topics or anything they'd like to share with the group? It's a, you know. Fair game. Anybody can share anything. Uh, we can talk about the questions that Indriani brought up earlier, or if anybody else wants to share anything, um, we're just here. We're hanging out. Well, I was really interested in the later books with Anastasia's take on the future and how she projected her thought into the future to counteract all the darkness that was being planned. And it's beyond the dark window of time and that she set in motion everything that eventually came through the books to inspire all of us to do what we're doing with, you know, what she recommended and having one hectare of land and, you know, growing your own food, growing it live. And then, you know, That coupled to me with permaculture, which is phenomenal, and inspiring people to see what can be done on a small property and then building communities is what that's what I was looking for when I was 18. And I found a spiritual community then, but we developed, you know, we had huge eight, hundreds and hundreds of acres in Montana, but then the community kind of went through changes and everything. So we, a lot of us had to move out, out and do it on our own. And all my best friends who are in their 60s and 70s and were all gardeners. <laughs> It's like, you know, everything else kind of drops away when you get to a certain age where you've done your life mission, maybe most of it, and you want to get back to the soil. You want to get back to the land and and commune with, Mother Earth and the stars and in the sky and like the natives did. And, you know, the, the original people that lived on this all over the world and, you know, their various nations. So I see this kind of the seminal thing is the Aquarian age is composed of those is going to be wrought or, you know, built, so to speak, or created by conscious people who have put aside their ego and have incorporated a lot of the teachings that Anastasia gave Vladimir and, and really mastering themselves. And then wherever we are, we're connected. We're all working to the same thing, which is planetary harmony, unity, oneness, beauty, you know, returning the earth to its pristine state. And It's just wonderful to meet anybody who's read the Anastasia books because we we grok each other, right? <laughs> It's like we we understand. Yeah. That we all loved, you know, we loved everything that was shared, and the history of Russia. I mean, that was phenomenal because even now, Russia's getting such a bad rap in the media, our, our mass media, with what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. And it's not the Russian people, you know, they're beautiful people. It's just, you know, what's what's happening. And I, I think there's a lot more to what's happening that we don't know in Ukraine than what we hear through our Western media. I mean, the, you know, when I talk to Russian people here in the United States, they know what's really happening. And I think Anastasia knows exactly what's happening. And I feel she is the, the preeminent 
exponent of the way for us to create, co-create the Aquarian age, family by family, kin's domain by kin's domain, space of love by space of love, and then smaller com you know, communities that come together. And you know, my dream for forever has been to have a spiritual community. And I was part of one for 30 years, and then it kind of dissolves. So now we have to start over. But but we didn't have Anastasia before. So now we have her, and we have her example and her teachings. And so I've got a good friend, Brad, in Costa Rica. I'm going to have to see if I can give her name to you, get her permission. And she's a beautiful, she's a, uh, a beautiful veterinarian in her um, late 30s. She's got one, one child. I don't know where she lives in relation to you, but uh, just to connect with people that believe the same thing and hold the same values in, in our hearts and our minds is, is a wonderful thing. So anyway, I think, I think the Anastasia books like saved me, so to speak, from not that I had to be, quote, saved, but they inspired me to do something more, a lot more than I ever dreamed I could with the land and, the, and you know, planting trees and understanding how to put the big evergreens around the, the outside. And then you do your fruit trees as a giant evergreens, you know, protect them. And it creates a microclimate. You know, we put a pond in, which is also called a crater garden with three levels. And it literally changed the climate on our property, totally changed it. We had a beaten down horse pasture. Now everything is totally green. You got trees everywhere. It's like a little Eden. So if anybody's in Montana, please, you know, feel free to contact me and you can come and visit our, our property. So thank you. David, I love hearing you talk, brother. I love it. And uh, I should definitely create a Montana group and, uh, I should, we should have them for all the states, but you know, whenever people appear. But um, I love seeing the connection, uh, connecting somebody to Brad out there. That's great, and yeah, that's just fantastic stuff. Um, and actually, what you're talking about the microclimate and all this. Um, our last Russia America exchange, we we talked with a, an incredible man named Alexei uh, Gordonayev, and he is part of a. It's a community called Kavcheg, which is one of the oldest settlements in Russia. It's like 21 years old. And a lot of the domains there are like around 20 years old. His is He's been there since 2003. And um, he was saying what you're talking about, the climate just completely is different on the settlement and on the domains and all these little microclimates and all these things. And watching it play out over that period of time is amazing. And I want to share something here in the chat. This is a little... A little community call exclusive but he actually gave me he has he runs a fantastic youtube channel um and he did a bunch of tours of domains on the settlement all these domains that are like 20 years old gorgeous domains and uh, he gave me permission to subtitle and translate a bunch of the videos into english and i did one but it's kind of rough we need to edit it or whatever but if you guys want to see a 20 year old uh, domain with some english subtitles you can check out that video and uh, it's, it's an older woman. She's got her domain. It's just like a flowering, beautiful paradise. Um, but we're going to properly translate these and edit them and then put them on our YouTube channel. So sorry, I don't mean to take up a lot of time here, but you got me excited about that, David. Anybody, please feel free to jump in at any time, you know, um, uh, I can jump in. Yeah, thank you, David. That sounds great. That's been a dream of ours, too, is always just trying to find that like-minded spiritual community that wants to get back to Mother Nature, I guess, and help restore its natural balance with humanity. It's We all know where it is going right now. It's a little bit chaotic, but um, got to stay strong and it's nice to see that there's people in this world when you find a uh, common vision, thanks to like Anastasia's vision, and um, that we can find a common ground. Like you said, this is more of an international group, not just North America, where people from all around the world. And um, 
yeah, really longing for that. And we put out our intentions here. We're, we're constantly meeting people that are coming from all around the world, young families, and they're all saying the same thing. I'm coming here because this is like paradise. I can grow food all year round. We're not dependent on the snow to shut it down or it's pretty, pretty easy going with the government here. It's pretty easy to get into Costa Rica and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to if your friend's open to make a connection and uh, we're scouting around. I guess that's why we checked out a new area. People told us to check out this area and they have a big farmer's market and really nice people that we're meeting that live here and that have moved here and are just growing organic food and just living good life, just, you know, getting back, just simplifying, getting off the rat race and just enjoying. And it's really different than, I must admit, when you pick a fruit from a tree fresh and just bite into it, it's so different than, than going to a supermarket and especially if something has been shipped across the world on a ship or a boat or a truck and ends up in your supermarket somewhere. <laughs> totally different taste, totally different taste, you know, so much healthier. We all know that. Thank you. I'll just let it be at that. No questions right now. Just, um, uh, Gabriel, I'll check out that, uh, join that, um, you just made that group, um, and telegram there for Costa Rica. Cause you mentioned before that you had a bunch of people or connections here. So, Definitely, definitely would like to, because we're definitely in the process um, of looking for land. We have um, a potential investor that wants to support us in finding a big chunk of land that we can then look at subdividing to a give at least one hectare, 2.5 acres for each potential person that wants to come here. We're trying to buy it at a larger wholesale price so that we can make it as affordable as possible for who who wants to live that dream here. Okay. I'll let it be at that. Thank you. That's awesome, brother. And we should, um, are you, Brad, are you on telegram? I am. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. So let's, let's connect there because I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you before and, um, I don't know if you guys were developing the project the last time we talked, but I put together actually a, uh, like a pitch deck, like a presentation deck that's geared towards, People with capital who may or may not be familiar with the Ringing Cedars, um, you know, like a heart-centered uh, potential donor who may want to fund or help, you know, resource a settlement. And uh, it's a really, really good deck. And uh, I'd be happy to share it with you. It's a bit of a template and you can edit it. But if you've okay. got like actual potential funders, um, it could probably help, you know, get get the ball rolling or get... Uh, get somebody over the hump of the you know the the decision yeah no that sounds great i appreciate it. i'm working we're working on the pitch deck actually i'm taking a course to develop like a pitch deck uh, business plan and yep. the financial projections right now so we're getting coached on that as well and they're nice they have multiple businesses and they're really big on seeing that make sure that you know it all makes sense they're they'll look at that but we mm -hmm. have we have their hearts into it already. They just said, no matter what you do, we're in. So just make sure we can Amazing. work out the financial projections to make it financial, you know, for everyone or whatever. And so we just have yeah. to work on that for them. But they just said either way we're in because that's what that's what they want to do as well as support people. Like what we're trying to do is developing something heart centered. For families to get back into the land and they really have their heart into that like they have made a fortune through multiple businesses and now they want to give back to the people in a sense like she said she wants to give back you know that's her what she feels i think people when they make so much that when they get to a point they just feel like i can just keep making more or i can now start helping people and she's at that point in her life where she wants to help other people so we're blessed to meet her and now we want to just make this happen <laughs> I'll, we'll connect on yeah i would like to see that pitch deck gabriel so I'll, we'll connect on telegram thanks beautiful can i speak 
I'm yeah, not sure. Absolutely. How, not sure really how this works. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my name is Deborah Welcome. Roberts. Thank you. And I'm really new to the Ringing Cedars. I read the whole series April. I got the whole series in April of last year, read them through in a few months. And I can say it changed my life drastically. Um, um, I started rereading them again recently. Um, it, it, I'm set, I'll be 75 this year. When I, in 1975, I starting, started having visions, which I've been silent about all my life. And some of the visions I was having was of something that looked like kin's domain settlements all over the earth. So I can't even talk about the ringing cedars without breaking down. And I understand. Because without I know for 50 years, I've seen this. I've held this vision. And I don't know exactly what to do now, but I have a van and in a couple of weeks, I'm going to start traveling and I'm going to, I'm right now I'm in Texas. Uh, the van is registered in Maine because I was living on the East coast when I um, read Ringing Cedars and I had to, some things to do out here, including getting the van ready. And I'm coming back to the East coast and I, I emblazoned all over my van, the ringing cedars of Russia. I want people to go, what's that? You know, and uh, I also put on my van, you know, let's create love's new earth. And I want people to say, well, what's that all about? So I can, you know, at least start somewhere talking and sharing because what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking, what I'm experiencing is that the planet itself is producing us here now. I don't even know how, if that makes any sense, but we're the intelligence, we're the thought, we're the brain cells kind of, and the communicators of the planet and they need us. And those of us that catch this vision and my goal isn't to recruit people to the vision. My goal is to find people who already have it and just want a, a connection because most people, they already have it, those who have it. They've found it. They just haven't found the words. And so Anastasia just, or Anastasia just gives the words. And it's just so amazing. And um, so I don't really know um, exactly um, where I'll be next year or what I'll be doing next year. Um, definitely need to want to connect to other people um and i'm i have difficulties with technical things sometimes and um um it's just so beautiful what's happening i think a i think a spontaneous wave is happening across the planet and we just need to find ways and to connect and connect and connect so that people don't feel isolated or or crazy with their ideas because their ideas are the right ideas and it's what it's kind of what we're all tuning into from the divine and becoming co-creators because that's what we were born to do at this time is to bring bring about love's new earth bring about this earth that I've been seeing for so long and now it's happening and it's just it's absolutely amazing wow Deborah, thank you for being here is this your first time talking with any other readers have you met other yeah, readers before? yes yeah it's the first time I've met I only met one reader in person once and I went to wow. um 
the Exit and Build Land Summit here in Texas in May. And then I I met one reader there and we were just, you know, we felt like we'd found um, a kindred spirit. And so we shared a lot. But no, I haven't talked to people in person. Um, I've tried to share this with others. And I, you know, I, I'm not trying to recruit others to it. I'm trying to find those who have that inner spark that know when they see it. Mm. Oh yeah, this is what I've been looking for. But I, because th- I believe there's a lot of us, and and part of what I want to do is just find these everywhere. I think they're everywhere. I just don't yep. know them. I just don't know them yet. Yep. So. I think I think a lot of people could share that experience of at least my experience uh, when I first heard about domains or first read about the domains was like oh that's like what I wanted but a hundred times more clear and detailed and amazing right I feel like a lot of people probably share that feeling you know like I just wanted to live on a cabin in a cabin in the woods somewhere but then when I saw Ken's domains I was like oh that's that's actually what I want right and it's right. interesting and- you went to the exit and build summit. I bet there are so many people there. Like if they were presented with the idea that you know it, it would it would uh, really inspire their hearts. Well, they zoomed in David Holgram from Australia, and he has a new book which is very very exciting because in addition, you know, he was one of the founders of the permaculture movement. But then in addition to that, his new book is retrofitting suburbia, and it's such a dynamic idea because if this is going to be all over the world, which it is, I'm not saying if, but for this to manifest globally, it we we it we have to transform even existing communities and turn them into permaculture kins domains <laughs> communities. And I, I'm just so jazzed. There's just so much work to do that I don't know where to start, but you know, I'm I'm getting in my van and um, trying to create at least when people see that van, they're going to say the ringing cedars of what? You know, Russia? Is that the place that's, you know, uh, whatever the, the false uh, information is or true information? I don't know. I don't pay attention. I don't try to decipher what's true in politics because it's part of a system that one of the vi- the vision I had, I, I, I keep having visions. And one of the visions I had in 2020 was I was lying in bed and there were two, glo- well, first there was one globe, you know, just like that beautiful globe, the blue globe, only small. And it's floating above me and it starts to divide. And part of it phases down to the right and part of it phases up. And the bright one is going up to the left and the dark one is coming down. And then I had got the message that, okay, so where you put your attention, that's where you're going to be. And that was before I found the ringing cedars. But, you know, with the pandemic, everything, my job closed down, everything closed down. So I was more like, okay, so big change is coming. What's happening? And then I had that vision and I go, okay. So how do I actually do that? You know, what do I do to put my attention on this new earth that's coming in? Because it is our attention and it is our mindset that creates things. So how do I contribute to that? How do I make, and I still don't know exactly how, but the Ringing Cedars has been uh, something that I just want to shout from the rooftops so that everybody that can connect, connects. I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> that made a lot of sense. That made a lot of sense. I mean, I, I want to scream about <laughs> the ringing cedars to everybody too. Um, I, I totally understand. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that you found us. Um, and that I, I love doing these calls because I remember what it was like when I had never spoken to another reader, right? It's so, it's so affirming. Um, to just be with others that have the same vision in their heart. Uh, And if anybody else wants to jump in, that was beautiful. I'm actually just here um, doing, I had to do something else real quick, but yeah, this is, this is wonderful. 
Yes, thank you for what you do. It's my pleasure. I'm definitely I want to uh, start very meeting lucky people man. live. You know, I want to drive around and meet live people and and see, you know, see for myself what's connect, connect, connect yeah. physically, connect physically because that's what this is all about is actually connecting physically to the earth and connecting physically in to each other by being in in proximity so right this is this is what i try to you know promote people to do and maybe there's a way that i could do a better job of, of making people aware of it but like people meeting in person right relationships this is really what starts to change destiny and, and spur the future into reality, you know, and, and people just meeting in person, connecting, making friends, finding soulmates and or best friends and all these, these things. And the people who will be your next door neighbors on your domain and all of this, right? If you wanted to host a meetup, Deborah, wherever you're going or meet other readers, like, let me know, let us know, well, put I've it in the Telegram chat. I'm headed east at some point. I want to stop and see you for sure. Okay. <laughs> you know, well, if you're in I Nashville, I want to North do Carolina. that. I want cool. to start, you know, it's like sometimes when people go, don't believe all of this stuff, I go, well, well, there's this guy. He actually went to Russia. He actually met Meg Ray. No, 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 you guys. This stuff is real, you know, but. This is true. But, yeah, I did meet him. Know. And I got to touch you because you touched Meg Ray. You know, it's like. <laughs> I'm not that special. Don't worry. No, no. Oh. Show us your feet, Gabriel. Special. Show us your feet. It's it's not the specialness. It's Sh the reality of it. This isn't I a. Didn't hear you, Lenny. It's not a virtual thing. You know, you're a real thing. Yeah. That's what I. You right. Know, people are. I exist on the material know. plane. People don't know what to believe anymore because of everything that's coming along and what's real and what's fabricated and what's not. It it it's really um you know, this is what we need to this is what we need to get. I mean, these are tools to connect, but they're also tools that separate because we can't there's not a physical physical connection through um it can be used to enhance mm -hmm. real connection but it isn't real connection mm -hmm. right yeah. that's that's exactly how i feel about all the digital stuff you know it's wonderful i mean look at us we're all here together like this yes, is just absolutely. blessed already right and the fact that's why i ask people to share their locations and we can see what's going on. Like we saw a connection, you know, David and Brad and like other people here. And um, this is, I, I want people to meet in person. So maybe I've been thinking about this more, about more what I can do to try to, to help facilitate these things. But yeah, if you're, if you're coming by uh, Western North Carolina, feel free to stop by. And uh, anybody here, if you guys are trying to host meetups, it's like, that's, that's where it all starts. We meet each other friendships and dreams get energized and things start to go you know that's um many hands make a miracle right we we all need each other and um i don't know that's my thinking on it i'll get off my high horse here but deborah it's it's so nice to hear you talk i love hearing your your energy and your passion and and your enthusiasm and and you seeing all this like you're saying the visions you've been having for so long uh coming true right through the ringing cedars. I mean, um, I can only imagine how, how beautiful that is for you. It is. Yeah. Thank By the you. way, Lena, thank you for the beautiful message, Lena. I'm just going to put this in the chat or unless you, unless you meant to send that directly to me. Sometimes people send me messages. I don't know if they mean them for the group. Um, beautiful. Yeah. For the group. Yeah. yeah, for the group. It's just because I'm such, I'm not tech savvy, you know, but um, I wanted That's to. That's what I emphasize. thought I'd ask. Yes. <laughs> yes, go on, say it. Oh, no, I just, I just wanted to ask. Um, she, she sent me a message that I put here in the chat. So um, thank you. That's very kind, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's very, true. very kind. Yeah. 
Yeah, your mission is actually the missing link because we all had our special journeys with the books and we were kind of spread all around the globe feeling isolated. And so connecting it into a big hole, this is what's going to move the universe. <laughs> this is amazing, Gabriel. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's very kind. I, I do what I, I do what I'm able to do, you know, whatever I'm able to do, I will do. So um, anyway, I, I'll start getting all emotional if I start talking about that. <laughs> but thank you. Um, yeah, it's so nice to see everybody here. It's always nice to meet new people and to see old friends. Uh, I, this is what it's about, you know. I have a question to ask the group or anyone specific, no one specifically, yeah. if that's okay, Gabriel. Um, late, lately I've been having like, um, really like amazing, like vivid, vivid dreams where even if I wake up, I'll go back into it. It goes on another dimension, another level. Lately, it's been like for a long time, I've been like flying in my dreams and now I'm like open up kind of like a flying school where I teach people how to fly, um, in, you know, in this, so it's kind of like in this dimension, in this life. Sorry, my kids are a little loud in the background. <laughs> but um, yeah, but it's it's so like it honestly, it feels like so real, like more real than when I wake up and I'm like, OK, go pick some fruit and let's eat and start my day. But like it's real, like I don't know how to explain it, but it's like it's real. It's really happening. I can feel it. So I don't know if we're just entering in the human consciousness as as on a on a global level where there's more and more people that are opening up their intuition and that's aligning that openness where we are going to tap into the next dimension where it is very possible and it is funny enough in that dream flying was one part of it but i think last night when i started flying i started going and i could experience going through a portal where then i could go anywhere in time and space because it's funny enough my kids are asking about they're five years old but they ask about what is time and what is space and all these questions at five when they were i think three years old they're asking where do we come from at three years old i don't think i've ever asked that question at three or five i think it was more when i was like 18 but you know so it's kind of like so they have some pretty deep questions so it's but anyways, yeah, I'm just saying, like, I don't know if anyone's having, like, more recently, like, really vivid dreams that are, you know, that's has some meaning or just some personal feeling or they, they want to share with the group. So, um... Elizabeth left a comment there as well in the chat. Evelyn, please. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's 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 okay. Um, when I was a child, I used to have the dreams that I was flying, and uh, then I think once I got into uh, school, uh, I stopped. Um, I I still don't really have the dreams, but um, on on the the question of the, the energies and the planet and uh, people waking up. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with things like the great year or the, the Indian concept of the different cycles of civilization, of, of illumination for humanity that spans 26,000 years. You know, and those are all things that, that people talk about. From, from an astronomy standpoint, our, our sun, our solar system is moving through a different part of the, the galaxy spiral. Um, all of the planets are showing signs of a lot more energy inputs going through them. The, the storms on some of the planets changing, rings showing up where they weren't before temperature changes. And even here on, on Earth, the, 
the warming up, which they're trying to attribute to humans. Um, it's all part of a larger picture going on in the galaxy, in the region of the galaxy that we're going through. And, I, you know, I'm no expert. Uh, I think it might be related that, you know, we're getting bombarded with a lot of this energy and it's helping some of us wake up. It's helping some of us get through our shadow work. It's helping us, you know, see through all of these fake concepts that we have been indoctrinated into that are the complete opposite of what Anastasia is teaching us. And it's really helping us to see how far we move away as a civilization from what Anastasia is teaching us of how we should be living and the things that we should be able to do that we replace with technology instead of doing them innately ourselves because we've moved so far away from the land, from the ground, from Mother Earth. So I just wanted to share, share that little bit. Yes, beautiful, Evelyn. Does anybody want to respond? And Elizabeth, I see you have your hand up as well. Uh, I just wanted to ask if anyone has noticed the sun rising and setting in a different position to what it used to um, over the last couple of years when we are in our house for seven years. I knew exactly where it would rise and fall at different times of the years and um, like in different seasons. Um, and now it's because it, in the middle of summer, it used to rise directly east and set directly west. Uh, now it's more southerly in the summer and, and that's completely odd. It's never. Um, and I know um, it's definitely a different location because we're in that same house for that amount of time. So I could see exactly where it was rising and, and it was just, and I'm, I'm just blown away that that's happened and, I know some people that have noticed it, but it's just like it's all gone unnoticed. And I'm just wondering if anyone here has noticed anything similar. I haven't noticed that specific thing with the sun, but I have noticed here in New York on the East Coast of the Americas that the seasons are shifting. That the intensity of the sun is more like it would be in Puerto Rico than how I remember it as a child here in New York. That, that there is something going on with the sun, that the intensity is changing. And the sun, you're seeing it shift, would go along with the climate shifting, the summers and the winters. I mean, I remember noon used to be the hottest part of the day. And now it's 4 p.m. I'm like, when did that happen? Like something's going on for sure. Hmm. It's interesting because as as you're talking about this, uh, is my mic on? Um, as you guys are talking about this, uh, I'm just reading through different parts of the books again and um anastasia in book four she says the sun the sun's rays are part of the energy and feelings that many people reproduce right um and that's another little thing and then there's that section where she says that the creator has shown forth with a new energy right and um oh somebody just joined the group and just making me think you know um this accelerated energy of of love uh, especially avoiding this global catastrophe that Anastasia mentioned that might have happened in 1992 if it weren't for the Dachniks, um helping us avoid that. Maybe this increased energy uh, coming off the earth, right? Because people are touching the earth with love. Domains are being created and all of this. Perhaps um, it's intensifying the energies of the sun and and accelerating life, right? It's my hypothesis. 
Well, this goes exactly with what I put in a book that I was privileged to write called Advanced Studies of the Human Aura. And it was kind of overshined by a divine being. Uh, some of you may have heard of El Moria and the Agni Yoga group in Russia, the Agni Yoga uh, organization, which they have a beautiful, beautiful uh, museum in New York. I've been to twice uh, for those in New York. But um, uh, Hel Helena Rurik and Nicholas Rurik were Russian. And so this master named El Moria, who was one of the founders of Theosophy, um, gave me this whole teaching on on the aura. But and the, the whole essence of the book is that we are meant to be solar beings. And our, our higher self is really like a sun already. It's just we haven't accessed the full potentiality of it. So I can see how anything related to the sun and its, its intensity, its spiritual intensity and the fire of divine light emanating from the sun is definitely impacting us. And, you know, 12, 21, 12 was pretty in, in, incredible, the end of the Mayan calendar. And I, I believe there was a big shift on the whole planet then. And we, we happened to be in Peru at, uh, we went to Machu Picchu and then we went to the, uh, the sacred place. And there were five other spiritual groups there, all dressed in white. It was pretty cool. But we were all focused on the sun. And, and in fact, the pre-Incan civilization uh, at Machu Picchu, they called themselves the children of the sun. So I believe that this, it, it dovetails with everything Anastasia is taught, teaching us that we have to return to our solar origin as light beings. And, and when we do that consciously, we're, you know, we become just this blazing sun. You know, one of my gurus, I don't know if you've ever heard of Omran Mikhail Ivanhoff. I had never heard of him until 2005, but he taught, he was born in, um, in Eastern Europe in Bulgaria, and he taught in France for almost 50 years. And his whole teaching was about meditating in the morning before before um, sunrise, which the dawn, I never knew this, but the dawn is actually 30 minutes before the sunrise. Did you know that? I never knew that. <laughs> but technically the dawn is before the sunrise. So he and his disciples would meditate a half hour before the sunrise in silence. And he taught to just incorporate all the, the intelligence, the divine intelligence of the rays of the sun into your being. And his disciples, could, you know, in his presence, just felt the power and intensity of his aura, which was like a sun. I think, I, I, I truly believe Anastasia is, is a, like one of these solar beings who came to, you know, basically help save the earth. And if it weren't for her, you know, where would we be? I mean, she made a lot of sacrifices. Even having children with uh, Vladimir was probably kind of a big sacrifice for her in one sense. But, but um, you know, she's a miracle lady. And I think she's one of the highest spiritual beings on the planet. And um, so I don't know why I brought all this, but I do believe things are shifting. And I, I honor what you said about the sun being in a different position, because I didn't really think about the fact that it is now warmer at three and four o'clock in the morning and the afternoon than it is at one, 12 or one o'clock. When I grew up in Chicago, yeah, 12 to one was the hottest part of the day. And ever since I've been in Montana now, three and four o'clock in the afternoon is the hottest part of the day, whether it's June, July, August, or whatever. So I never noticed that before. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, this is a really interesting topic because I put some quotes in the chat about this, about the sun um, from Anastasia. But basically, her and her grandfathers maintained that 
the sun is a reflector of the bright and radiant feelings coming off of man, right? And so the sun is like a mirror. And so the source of the sun's energy being the radiance of the human soul, right? And the original lighting of the sun being God's soul lighting up the sun and reflecting his his beautiful light to everyone and giving life. And so it's like that quote from the Bible. What is it? Uh, in John, um, in him was was uh, life and the life was the light of men, I believe it is. Um, and so it kind of makes me think that um, I've heard, you know, I've heard stories. There's a story about the life of Paramahansa Yogananda where he was in a room and there was a rose in a vase and he's walking around and the rose is changing this, its direction towards him as he walks around the room, right? Um, and and they're like, oh, we've got a new, uh, we've got a new member, right? This new rose disciple. Um, and and it, it's very interesting to think that humans, um, Anastasia talks so much about the, the light of love that comes off of us, right? That grace uh, that the animals and, and the plants and the uh that all of life is kind of aspiring to to be warmed by right um if we were if we were in the ideal state as god wanted us to be we would be putting out that much light and love because that's that's what god himself does we're his children we should be radiant like the sun everything in the universe should be benefited by our presence and our light and that's essentially that's who we are, right? You know, uh, the great masters and those people full of love. Um, you know, it's so interesting, man. Like, I remember I went to the settlement in 2016 and I met one particular man who had been creating his domain for, I, f I forget how many years at that point, but probably like 10 or 15 years or something, creating his domain, had children there, beautiful family, his wife and all of this, beautiful, mature domain hedge and all of this beautiful gardens and he just like his you you could feel this incredible warmth coming off of his body like an energy that i'd never felt before and it was like he was really 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 warm and also unbelievably happy and i just found that to be so interesting right like we are beautiful souls and sparks of of god himself god gives life to everything our love and our joy reflect off the sun shining onto everything and giving life or also that story in book four at the end of book four where the kids are together in the school on this settlement in the future and they're doing this experiment and they're all focusing on that little flower plant in the pot and they're saying uh, the little girl she gets up and she says i'm gonna pretend that i'm the sun right and i'm gonna shine on this plant and then and eventually they they get the plant to bloom Right. It also makes me think uh, they, they said Lord Buddha, when he would walk around that sometimes, you know, plants and flowers would begin to bloom in his presence. Right. When he stood wherever he walked, the, the flowers would bloom behind him. Right. And uh, that's just so beautiful to think that just a human stepping on the ground would give life to everything around it. And so um, this is something that I, I love to think about. And and uh, I think it's it's definitely the high state of who we who we are right? Uh, I love, I absolutely love this topic. I just wanted to chime in that from a physics standpoint, light is a particular wave of energy moving through time and space. And oh, it's sound. And, you know, we emanate energy from our hearts, from our bodies. That energy could be viewed as light, which I, I, I believe is how they do the aura, photography kind of a thing. So yeah, I mean, we're essentially emanating light. And I, I, I always love the phrase that I am a soul, but I have a body. So I'm not this physical form. This is like the Waldo glove or the interface that I use to, inter to interact here. And this form is only going to last for so long and it'll join the earth. 
but my soul, my essence, my consciousness, that that never ends. That always continues. That keeps coming back or it's on this plane or it's on the next one, which is completely light or the one above that, which is completely consciousness. And I, I know that even here now, we can connect with those higher parts of ourselves and communicate with those parts of ourselves that are not in our physical form. They're in those other planes and have conversations with ourselves on those other planes and find out what they're doing, how they're helping the planet. It's an interesting conversation. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. I'm also reminded of that that story in book five where the young equestrian woman, right there, this is the future of Russia, and uh, there is a settlement off in the distance from the highway, and the woman rides up on her horse, and then uh, she interacts with another young mother there who lives in the city, from the city, and there's a moment where Vladimir is describing what he's seeing and he's saying that um, this woman who's standing here looks like a million like blooming roses or something and kind of this outpouring of this life-giving energy kind of flowing from this woman right in and then eventually she looks at the the other younger woman who is kind of more tired and she puts this energy into her Right. And uh, it's really inspiring to think about how much love we were created to potentially feel. Right. Um, how good the creator is that he wanted us to be overflowing with joy and love to a, a supreme degree that is hard for us to even wrap our minds around. Right. At, at where we currently are, you know, um, I, I find that to be such a great confirmation of well, of, of what, I don't know exactly, but such an, such an encouraging idea, right? Such an encouraging idea that uh, we can live that way in this state of love, right? And Anastasia's grandfather talks about how uh, the highest state of health for us to achieve is one of, of being in love, right? In, in book 8.2, we can only attain this highest thing of, of health and well-being and our mental powers and all this, if we are in that kind of radiant state um, of love, right? And I I love to think about this. Uh, I, you know, I'll keep going and talking about the philosophical parts of this. Um, I could talk about this all day, but if anybody else wants to jump in or if anybody else has any any topics they'd like to bring up, Thank you, Deborah, for the message. It's very kind. Yeah, I find I find Anastasia is um I'm excited for when science, well, I don't know, science or popular thinking begins to catch up to what is shared in the books, the idea of the sun being a reflector of the of the light and the grace and the joy coming off of humans. I think that would completely shift how people perceive themselves here on the planet. Like you are a source of life itself. The plants in the forest are blooming and flowering in part due to the joy and, and the love coming out of your heart, right? And you actually give life to things around you and you actually have that kind of power. Like how would little kids think if they, if they knew? They probably know this somewhere intuitively, but if they were told that directly, you give life to everything around you right through your joy right um i i just find this uh to be such a paradigm shifting idea in itself right uh life itself benefits from your presence <laughs> it's it's a it's a complete paradigm shift right people want to think the sun is a burning ball of gas which is just like wow um wow but uh it's comedy at least but um so 
yeah i'm excited for the day that uh people start to realize this i think it'll change a lot of people's minds but don't let me keep talking because i'll i'll just go i'll just go on an endless thing about this How's everybody feeling? Super good conversation so far. Yeah, Lenny, Elizabeth, Brad, beautiful. Yes, yes. Well, this is really inspiring for me, man. You guys are um, just amazing. It's so, so great to talk with you all. And uh, Lena tells me to keep talking. I mean, I don't know. I can keep talking if you guys want, but this is the community call. So I'm trying to give people space. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody, if anybody else wants to jump in, I'm more than happy to, I don't know. I, I think about these things a lot. I mean, even the moon too, right? There's no, you know, cause talking about how the sun is a reflector of the love and the joy and grace coming off of uh, man. Um, Anastasia's grandfather in book one says that only bright and radiant feelings can travel up into space and then be reflected off of the celestial bodies. So you'd also have to assume that that includes the moon and the stars and everything else, which is really interesting too, right? Because the sun is associated as this direct life-giving thing, but so is the moon in its own spectacular way. So the moon, and the stars and the planets and everything else. It's like, we set all of this in motion. Um, and it, very interesting. Anastasia is talking about from book one, how to interact with your planets, right? How to get the planets to start working beneficially for you. Right. I mean, I've gone outside so many times and, you know, slept under the stars or, uh, I've, I've have prayed many, many times while thinking of God, but looking at the stars and connecting with the universe. And I feel this great power that comes in when I connect with, uh, with the universe, you know, in that way, like looking at the stars and Anastasia says that the planets and the stars are waiting for uh man, you know, they're waiting for, a, a, like a, this kind creator to, to help and, and, you know, uh, they're waiting for orders from people who understand this to to be of assistance, right? They have no will to act on their own, but they carry out the will of of the people who, you know, set things in motion and um, right and connecting with the universal database and all of this. I think uh, you know uh, there's a lot to be explored with that our connection uh, with the planets and our ability to influence them and. Um, anyway, you know, you guys are going to get me into my, uh, uh, all the things that I think about all the time. And I don't know if you guys want to go down that route, uh, but, uh, I hope this is interesting and would love to hear from anyone else. If you guys want to change the subject, please feel free. Well, I just wanted to say that, um, since we moved to this new place, it's kind of inland and uh, so we've just been exploring what's in this area of Costa Rica, some mountains and different things for the kids to check out. And we haven't been to the ocean in probably about three weeks. So we decided to take the kids and go to the ocean. And it's a, a new beach we haven't explored before. And I noticed the waves were quite intense and the riptides were kind of strong. So the kids more or less stayed on the beach to play on the sand. Usually they go running in the ocean right away, but I think they saw it and they knew better stay on the land. But me, <laughs> being attracted to the ocean, I always get called to go out. My wife said, don't go to the farthest one. You know, I said, no, I can see those waves are pretty strong. They're pretty, those waves are big, like probably about eight foot waves. You know, I'm not going to go venture that far. But um, anyways, I, I wandered out to the ocean and literally just, laid in the water just floated i was probably there for about an hour just floating with the waves and um just just reflecting just being grounded with just it's so energizing to kind of it just de-stresses you it takes all the negativity out of you the ocean just does something amazing and the sun like you said this connection to the sun the, the light and just 
this reflection, I would stand there and just observe the power of the ocean, the power of the waves, like Mother Earth is just so powerful. And just like getting like reset. So then on our way back, we we're able to talk and kind of reset our intentions of really, we got to move fast and get this going, get this um, intentional group, this gathering, this tribal gathering of people together it was such a longing such a desire to really connect more the more we like we're doing here the more we can connect and dialogue it's great it's it's like the only thing we're missing is like this campfire setting where we kind of sit around a campfire and tell stories gabriel you're great at storytelling so i think like that's kind of what we got to get back to the the roots of our native ancestors and just share stories of um, what we've done and what we continue to do and get disconnected from all of this, you know, what they call social media devices. We, we're, we can use them. I, I get it. We need to use them for um, what we're doing right now. But even at this time, we're really trying, to, I mean, we're, we're doing a great job. We're not allowing our kids to use them at all. It was a big struggle to my grand, uh, the kid's grandfather, my father-in-law wanted to gift them these pads when they were like, when we arrived here, when they were three or four years old. And we said, no, we don't want that connection for them at that age. We just want them to connect with nature, with the animals, with the trees. And that's what they do. They just, they love that more than anything. Just when they went to the beach, that was it. And they just found a, they told us they want to go play with these other two little kids in the sand. They had some, you know, sandbox toys, whatever. And that's what they did. So that connection, they knew what to do right away. <laughs> we didn't have to ask them. They just, they told us, I want to do this. <laughs> okay, let's do that. But um, can you share the rainy season in Costa Rica? Yeah, the rainy season is funny. Um, so right now is the rainy season. They call it winter in Costa Rica. Um, where we live now is kind of like a, a we go through this rain cloud uh, mountain rainforest clouds and we live in a valley area so we can see these beautiful rain this clouds go through the valleys but it'll rain towards the end of the afternoon um, and then sometimes it can rain through the whole night you can hear it just pouring but then usually by morning time, when the sun rises, like around 536 here in Costa Rica, it's like, it's not pure sunshine, there's clouds, but it's like the sunny part of it. And then it'll stay like that until, you know, two, three or four o'clock and it goes through the rainy process again. So it's not like it's raining buckets all the time. You get to definitely go out and enjoy, you know, the weather and enjoy the nature for sure yeah definitely not winter gabriel <laughs> i had a laugh too <laughs> definitely not our winters that we're used to in winter. North America. yeah winter we kind of chuckle <laughs> my my kids were conditioned by our winters in canada they would go outside when they're little kids just in their diapers when it would snow and they would just go outside just in a diaper and put the snow off the the ground and just start eating the snow from the ground the fresh snow so they kind of carry that tradition here there's no snow but wherever we go they want to order a cup of ice and they just start eating ice so it's their um <laughs> their canadianness of them to eat ice they are like you mentioned about energy they're both a ball of energy just you can feel them you can touch their skin or the soles of their feet and it, they're just so much heat yes that's Brad? yes evelyn so in, in costa, yeah yeah in, in costa rica um like during the rainy season do you have like several consecutive days of just rain just overcast or um it's like I said, it's like right now it's overcast because right now it's um, we're getting on into the late afternoon, early evening. Yeah, it's like 550 here. So it's um, 
overcast, but we went early this morning to go do a beach day. So it was um, a light overcast. The sun definitely, you know, went through um, and you'll get sometimes just some pure sunshine and just clouds in the sky, but days on end rain, um, not really. If anything, you're going to get maybe one good solid, maybe two solid days of rain. And I've experienced that where you, if you try to go outside, it rains so hard that the ground can't even wash it away fast enough. So you're literally walking in about six inches of water. That's how much rain comes down. Like literally the sky opens up and it just pours buckets like that kind of rain. And so I've experienced that, like, since I've been here almost three years, I've counted, like, the hardest rainy days, like, on one hand, maybe five days in the year where it pours like that, like, just, just buckets. But usually it'll rain for an hour or two, and that's the rainy season, winter season. So, yeah. And that, and that makes up for the summer, the summer at least where we lived before, it was like uh, Guanacaste is the Pacific, North Pacific. Um, and uh, we don't see a drop of rain for five months straight. So from end of November to end of April, it's you don't see one drop of rain. Just pure sunshine every day. Yeah. Wow. Just, yeah. Then you're dealing with a lot of heat. <laughs> And mm -hmm. find find the shade. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. that. We kind of had the impression that it was more like the monsoon kind no. of a thing, like in India, where you know it's just days and days of rain with no sun, and the, the land gets super saturated, and everything's getting you know washed washed no. away. No, okay. not not oh, like that great. at all. Yeah. I think oh. it probably rains a lot more like in British Columbia, like um, western coast of Canada than it does down here, you know. Thank you. Thanks. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that anywhere in that region of the world could be so dry for so long. That's pretty interesting. And yet things wow. grow, things still stay so green, even during that dry season. Like I've noticed the permaculture difference, like where my father-in-law, he just has a small plot of land. But when you look on Google Maps compared to the other farming areas where they just have, let's say, cattle and the grass will turn brown, the cows still go and eat it. And there's something still growing there, obviously. But where my father-in-law planted more of the um, fruit trees and once you get these big mango trees 20 25 year old mango trees growing they're, they're huge and then you have all these other kind of plants growing underneath that it's like a forest so you can't even see the house really from the google map and because of that forest it just creates this lushness so even though it doesn't rain it stays green like the trees are green and fruit bears, you know, comes out and it's pretty amazing. Like, where does it get the moisture from? <laughs> I think it's just that, you know, that once you grow the trees, it, it pulls it in the moisture and it feeds itself kind of thing. That permaculture. Mm. Yeah. yeah, like from deep down water yeah. retention. Yeah. Yep. So you're able to and enjoy the outdoors all day throughout the entire year? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's like if you get up with the sun and, you know, you, you spend, you go out, you can be out there until three, four o'clock, you know, every day, you know, even now it's it's overcast, but it's not raining. It didn't rain at all today. So it might, it might and might not rain tonight, but, it, you know, it's almost like every night or every other night it rains kind of thing. So... Have you tried to swim with a dolphin there? I I did on my one of my previous trips here. We went to another part. We went out on a boat and um, we went out swimming. I didn't get really that close. 
to them, but we we went down and we saw the those giant leatherback turtles when we did a little bit of snorkeling, went underneath and we could see these big leatherback turtles. But yeah, there's definitely all kinds of wildlife, you know, definitely. So our our kids have played with tarantulas, probably the scorpions if we allowed them, but uh, we didn't want them to, <laughs> but somehow they wanted to play with this tarantula, but we were, we were cautious and they didn't get bitten or anything like that. <laughs> They're very more adventurous than us, put it that way. <laughs> right. Deborah said she had to go. She messaged me. Deborah, thank you so much for being here. It was great hearing what you had to share earlier. Have a beautiful I had, night. Gabriel, I had a comment about what you were talking about earlier today, just before. It, it, it feels to me like it's honest as it talks about how we are to give the animals direction and training and instruct them in how to have them assist us. And it almost felt to me like this is also true of the planets, of the stars, of the sun, you know, all the physical items around us that are energy, our will extends to even guiding them in how to be and how to interact to create the environment that would be most pleasing for us. Yeah. I think I think exactly that. I think um her talking about interacting with the planets from the beginning of the series is no coincidence. I think uh, that chapter, sleeping under one star and, and establishing our connection with the planets and her telling us exactly how to do that is no coincidence. Um, and throughout the series, everything being spoken of as, you know, the planets essentially work to carry out um, cause and effect, right? They they make things happen. There's a There's a specific quote from book one that I could pull up here where she talks about like horoscopes and the planets and things. But yeah, I did it. I mean, a really interesting thing that I could share, like I, I did a little experiment on the, uh, on the summer solstice where um, I was thinking about exactly this topic and the idea I was reflecting upon how throughout different cultures across the planet, um, people say that our ancestors engaged in sun worship, right? But that would be to make our ancestors appear ignorant as if they're just worshiping the sun as if it's like some kind of deity. Anastasia is saying that, you know, our pagan ancestors and then even further back, the Vedrus ancestors understood the purpose and the function of the sun and nature and the planets and all these things. And uh, I don't think they worship the sun as if it was a separate deity, but they probably understood its function and interacted with it directly, right? Like they knew that they understood in their souls and their minds how the sun worked and interacted with it. And so what we may have called people praying to the sun or worshiping the sun might have just been putting their will and their energy to the sun and it reflecting <laughs> their their energy back to the earth and setting things in motion and uh, hitting, you know, their body and influencing them. And so it made me think, I was like, huh, this is kind of an interesting thing. So I decided right on the summer solstice, like, let me just direct my energy towards the sun at this moment and uh, send my will to it and kind of pray in a way, but in a way of where I know the function of the sun and I'm kind of using it as this like reflecting thing. And uh, I did, I put my mind and my intention on the sun and I immediately felt like this crazy feeling inside of me, like I'd never felt in my life. I don't know how to describe it, but the whole energy inside of my body changed. Like instantly there was a response, like instantly, instantly there was a response of like, I felt entirely different. Um, and it was really strong. Don't know how to describe it. Um, I felt like, I don't know how to describe it, like clarity, a large increase in energy in my body, 
feelings of like harmony and calmness and peace. But like instantly, as soon as I directed my mind to the sun and started, um, you know, putting a prayerful intention to it, but using it as a, for what it is as a fun, you know, the, the function that it performs, um, it, I felt a very instant and immediate and strong, um, response from that and a whole shift, like in my consciousness, it was really interesting. So I think there's a lot for us as humanity to explore, uh, with our connection with the sun and the moon and the stars and, and all these things, uh, I think we're only beginning to, uh, scratch the surface with these things. Absolutely. There's an interesting section, by the way, in book, in the new version of book one, um, where Valodia, Anastasia and Vladimir's son is talking about, um, uh, sun plants and moon plants he says uh that that the green color in nature is is connected with the planet venus right and um so okay. it's a very interesting thing but talking about that um so you guys if anybody hasn't read the new chapters of book one which probably most people haven't you can find them in this folder that i just linked i translated them um from from russian but anyway i'll i'll get off that but yeah you're getting me in thinking about like the things that i find most interesting i'm evelyn i'm not sure if that was in line with what you were talking about but uh, that's what came no, up it, it is and i think it's really important because we're we're living at a time you know it, 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 in each age we've been disconnected at another level from our origin and in this age, we're being disconnected from that part of us that creates the thought at, in a big way. I mean, we're being taught that we're victims, that you know, we're at the mercy of the planet, we're at the mercy of the sun, we're at the mercy of the climate, that, you know, that we as individual creators have no role in any of that when it's the exact opposite. And your storytelling and us coming together and having these conversations and talking about how we really want the world to be, how we really want our lives to be, how we want our land, how we want to create our do kin's domains and put it all together. That is all part of regaining that part of our creative self that can actually bring that about and get away from all of this schooling that we've gone through that essentially teaches us that we're not able to do anything. And we're such powerful creations that can create such incredible things. And we're sitting here acting like we can't do anything. It's such a shame. Wow. I cannot agree more. And exactly to your point, I found this quote in book one where Anastasia says, God has created everything we can see, including the planets. They serve to guarantee the order and harmony of all life. Not only plants and animals, they also help human flesh, but there's no way they have power over man's heart and mind. Right. And then earlier she says you believe in horoscopes you believe in your complete dependence on the position of the planets this belief has been attained through the aid of the devices of the dark forces right and so how how much we've separated ourselves and think that we're subject to these cosmic forces but really we are the initiators of all of them right and we are actually at the center of the activity of the stars and the sun and the moon and uh all of this right and uh how powerful we are and how much power we actually have to influence life right how can anastasia one person's dreams do so much right um well anyway you guys are getting me real ref reflective but i love this conversation <laughs> yeah evelyn thank you for sharing it's beautiful you're, you're welcome. I, I, I truly believe that as we move back into that creative space, we are better able to feel where our kin's domain is, what it's supposed to be like, 
who are the people that are supposed to be there with us? You know, that, all of that is about us reclaiming our creative energy of us connecting back with source. How else are we going to be able to tell that this is the land that we want? This is the space that we want to create our kin's domain. This is where we want to place this particular plant. This is where we want to place the home. We have to reconnect with that. And that's what Anastasia wants us to do. That's where she's pointing us to go. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you reminded me, I recently translated an article, an incredible article that um, Alexei Garnayev wrote, who we just interviewed for the Russia America Exchange. And I'll put a link to the article here. Uh, kin's domains or eco villages it's called but he he talks about that the people who've been living on their domains for a long time have started to realize that the domain itself is a device that works for the materialization of of man's dreams right and he says there's people on the settlement who are using that power of the domain like consciously right as a as a device for interfacing with the universe and the planets to actually materialize their dreams right and this is something you know anastasia talks about this from book 1 connecting sleeping under your star and then she says the the planets and the stars will aid you in the attainment of your brightest and most unimaginable dreams and honestly to be real with you guys that's the whole reason i'm here i used to I literally did that for a long time like I think all everything that's happened in my life and the whole reason I'm here and everything that's at this point is because I used to go out under the stars and do this all the time and I I can say at least in my life I've seen and felt the power of this um and so anyway I'm uh, wildly interested in the subject <laughs> yes and when Lenny and I were in Texas as we traveled around to see where, where it felt like, you know, when we were in the spaces that filled our hearts. It's such an incredible experience to be on a piece of land that feels so good, that feels like home. And here in New York, I'm in a wheelchair. Over there, I'm walking. So I'm really excited to get out of here, and get out there onto the land that we're supposed to be on that's going to heal me, not just for the moment that I'm there for the vacation, but the good. Amen. God bless you, Evelyn. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. A bunch of hearts in the, in the, in the Zoom room here. I love it, man. I love it. Dear friends, we're right around the two-hour mark. Just want to check in. Brad, I love it. I love the heart reaction there. Yes. A lot of a lot of love for what you're sharing there, Evelyn. Um, such beautiful conversations. So glad to be able to speak with you all. Um, thank you all for being here. Does anybody have I, I'd love to hear from you all. Has has this been enjoyable? Has this been a nice experience for you guys, this call tonight? I know myself, I'm feeling really like uplifted and energized. Um, you know, but I'd love to hear your feedback and and if anybody has anything they want to share uh, before we get out of here, um, I'd love to hear. But thank you all so much for being here and, and taking the time to be with us. I'll just quickly Lena. jump in. Um, you. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Yeah, this is Beata. Um, I live... Uh, off Vancouver um, on uh, on Sunshine Coast, and I really resonated with so many people today. I'm multitasking, cleaning my house, and going on the ferry very soon, so I didn't really speak much. But I was listening to everyone and was very happy to hear everyone's sharing and input. Um, I was also the synchronicities of what Brad was sharing, and also from. David was sharing, I, um, yeah, and so, so, so grateful for you, Gabriel, for really bringing more and more of 
the text into our meetings. I really enjoy that part very much just to, yeah, to align uh, every time a little bit more. So yeah, thank you very, very much. And i um, very grateful to be with everyone today. Thank you, Beata. Thank you, so glad you're here. Yes, and uh, Evelyn, by the way, I don't know if you're reading the chat. I know you guys are moving through the city, but um, I'm just going to read this. Uh, Sandy said, beautiful Evelyn, my daughter is in a wheelchair, and that is my vision for my family that she can do the same. So beautiful, Sandy. Thank you for sharing. All right. Yes, what a beautiful conversation. Um, so I'm going to be doing these from now on, on the new moon of every month. And, uh, so easy to remember new moon. Um, today is the day after the new moon. I had something yesterday. Um, but these calls are scheduled out for the rest of the year, new moon of every month. Keep it easy. So, um, I'd love to see you again on the next new moon and, um, and see some new faces too. So thank you all for being here. Um, Really appreciate all your time. And yes, you know, good shall prevail, right? All these things that we're talking about are definitely going to come true. Uh, so keep dreaming, keep taking action. Uh, and friends, yeah, I'll connect with you guys outside of here. Everybody have a beautiful and blessed night. Thank you all for being here. Take care, everybody. If you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. Oh, yeah. I'll say that right at the end. Like, <laughs> comment, subscribe. Help us with the engagement. Help us uh, get more, you know, Ringing Cedars people on YouTube. Just comment for the algorithm. Comment for the algorithm. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. All right. See you guys later. Okay.